وكذلك أوحينا إليك روحا من أمرنا ما كنت تدري ما الكتاب ولا الإيمان ولكن جعلناه نورا ولكن جعلناه نورا نهدي به من نشاء من عبادنا وإنك لتهدي إلى صراط مستقيم صراط الله الذي له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض ألا إلى الله تصير الأمور Mind you, I was just like, wow, what am I supposed to say? Let me remind you, I know that it's something which is very sensitive. We're still following up on um, having an intimate relationship with the man and his wife as a mutual right, which both share. And I, I, I think we're talking about uh, the etiquette of having this kind of relationship. We we'll begin by saying that, saying that uh, the supplication which the Prophet ﷺ prescribed, then uh, uh, giving a nice introduction, not just attacking. And uh, we also said that um, uh, it is prescribed to give, you know, uh, uh, loves, kisses, hugs, and so on. That would re would really bring the wife to into the mood of having a relationship. What you're saying is to have a what I what I was going to say <laughs> was to have a a, a lawful. Uh, like a foreplay, a way to get yes. your wife in, in the mood and then yes. you in the mood to, yes. to, to do. I read that in Al Mughni. Um, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, may Allah be pleased with him, narrated that uh, a man before embracing his wife and having a sexual relationship with her has to get her ready. So that's stated in the Sunnah. It's not something that uh, we read in medical magazines or. No. Uh, that's something prescribed to have to get her ready. And a man asked the Prophet ﷺ how to. He said that uh, by kissing her and hugging her uh, until she is sexually aroused, then you can have a sexual relationship with her. Uh, that brings to my mind why many cases that a husband would complain that he called his wife to bed and she said no. Uh, there is also a great part of mistake on his side where he doesn't really approach her uh, nicely, he gently. <laughs> She starts to quit what she's doing and come and do it. And uh, to have this very, very special relationship, you have to be uh, extremely gentle and kind and understand that this is not a business that you're doing. It just satisfying your desire and run away. As a matter of fact, uh, there is a hadith that the Prophet has stated that narrated by Abu Ya'la that a man should be truthful to his wife while having a, a sexual relationship. How? how one should be truthful to his wife while having an, an intimate relationship. He said that if he uh, achieves a satisfaction, satisfaction of his sexual desire, he should not leave before making sure that she too have reached the same level her of desire, uh, being satisfied. And, uh, you know, uh, that's a mutual right. It's not only for the man. It's also for mm -hmm. the wife as well. This is a terribly sensitive subject for you, brother, isn't yeah. it? Yes. But how would one learn about that? What what's the source? Uh, you were talking. <laughs> <laughs> no, you there's, were talking. there are a lot of things that you haven't mentioned, and you you can't talk about it in the show. So remember one thing. Yeah. Remember one thing, that there is no limits between a man and a wife, in regards of what to see and what not to see. Except for two things. Okay. Two things you can't do with your wife. Yes. Mm -hmm. The second, you may embrace her and approach her sexually, from any position. As long as you avoid the back passage. So having a relationship in the proper place, whether from front, from behind, from whichever position, as the hadith stated, is permissible. And also keep in mind that you should avoid having a relationship or anything that leads to an intercourse during the menstruation. The menstruation. And of course, while fasting during the day of Ramadan or while mm -hmm. in a state of ihram, yeah, while performing hajj. Yes. Yes. So yes. is there a certain box or... What side that one can visit? Well, well definitely there is a beautiful book called Tuhfatul Wadud fi Ahkam al And uh, uh, And in English, there's uh, three books by Sheikh uh, Muhammad Jabali. Mm -hmm. uh, the one that people should read about this is, uh, um, what's it called? Bismillah. Closer than a garment. It's about how you should treat your yes. wife and the mutual, which are excellent resources in English. I mean, mm -hmm. 
as a translation of Tahfat al Aus, as a translation of the verse uh, which says that Hunna uh, libasul lakum wa antum libasul lahun. They are to you like uh, your garment, mm -hmm. and you are to them like their garment. This is how close you are to each other. No, you don't ever have a relationship like you have with your wife. No. I mean, it's mm -hmm. the closest Absolutely. relationship you have with anybody. No one whatsoever can see from you what your wife or your spouse uh, could see from you, mm -hmm. and vice versa. Uh, supposedly, a man is interested with a mutual agreement with his wife, of course, to have another relationship. The Prophet وسلم, he used to do that sometimes, but he would do the following. And this is very important etiquette we should uh, bring to your attention. The Prophet وسلم, would either perform wudu or ghusl. If you're uh, capable to perform ghusl right away, please do so, or otherwise at least wudu. Because that, uh, that's best for your personal hygiene, and that's also best to bring you to freshness and activity and make you Big stronger to have another relationship. You know what I notice a lot when we talk about this, it's kind of off topic, but how Islam and science kind of go hand in hand on a lot of things. They definitely go. Take a ghusl to make yourself clean for hygiene and science proves the same thing, but that's off topic. So <laughs> They definitely go. Yeah. Just uh, keep in mind that when you take a ghusl, there is an intention. You know, for a non-Muslim who takes a bath or takes a shower after having a relationship with his shower, wife, yeah. uh, is no ghusl because it's lacking of intention. The intention of having a ghusl is removing the major impurity mm. because once you have a relationship with your wife or there is a sexual discharge from either one right away that would require you to uh, uh, purify yourself by performing ghusl to be able to pray to be able to recite the Quran or enter the masjid uh, without that you can so it's uh, uh, required immediately uh, as much as you can I heard a good saying about intention that uh Actions without intention are like carrying around a water jug full of dirt. I mean, it's good you have the water jug, but it's doing you no good because it's full of we dirt. We have a hadith which is <coughs> the core of the deen that the Prophet ﷺ stated that indeed uh, actions are but by, by their intentions. intentions. Yes. Yeah. And every person will be uh, recompensed according to his intention, he not necessarily the action. Yes. yes. Yeah. That's one of my favorite hadiths. I'd like to say here that, um, um, let me say, um, uh, intimate relation is like a fruit. You cannot have a fruit without a tree. And you cannot have a tree without the soil. Mm -hmm. I'd like to uh, say that fruit is the intimate relation. Tree is the love. And soil is, um, let me say, patience and bearing each other. So if we have the tree, the proper tree, you will have the proper fruit. No, and then everything, the right everything comes I didn't know easy. that you invited a fort here. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah, I didn't know this either. <laughs> but that's actually very beautiful because you can't have a good tree if you have bad soil. And you can't have good fruit if you don't have a good tree. You see, Amr and Muhammad, who was the happiest man on earth? That was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Who was the happiest husband and the best of all? Muhammad that was Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. With all the responsibilities uh, he used to bear with all the duties he used to take care of. He was a leader of a nation. Yeah. Uh, he did not ignore his wives. the right of his wives. Yes. Mm. Plural. At once he had nine. Mashallah. The Prophet The best and of all humanity. He take care of all of them at once. Never ignore the right of any of them. So a man should really keep in mind that it's not only my rights, my hukuk, her duties upon me. No, it's also your duties upon her. My duties upon me, upon, uh, uh, the duties upon me towards her and her rights upon me. Uh, is it mentioned in the Sharia how often a man is advised to come to his wife? No, that goes to the Urf, what, uh, you know, a mutual agreement between the man uh, and his wife. We've discussed before that uh, Umar bin Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, once was uh, patrolling the city uh, in Medina and Munawwara. And he overheard a lady was uh, uh, chanting a poetry. Yeah. And he understood from that she, that she's been missing her husband, yeah. uh, who's been deployed uh, uh, to a battlefield. So uh, Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, right away went to his daughter Hafsa, who was the Prophet's wife, and inquired from her, um, Ya Hafsa, how long could a woman stay away from her husband? 
She said, and why do you ask such a question? He said, SubhanAllah, glory be to Allah, you know that I'm responsible for all those people. It's for the benefit of the Ummah. She said, um, uh, four to six months. Mm -hmm. So Umar al Khattab stated a very important rule, unprecedentedly, that any soldier, any Muslim who goes to a battlefield or deploy to a camp, that should not stay on the camp more than four months. And maybe a month going and a month coming back, so total is six months. Uh, keeping in mind that this wife who is staying home also have rights. rights. So the state, the individual, the family, everybody is playing a role in fulfilling each other's rights. So there is no limit. Uh, as you said, it depends. You gotta pray. He's still to go to the bathroom. Uh, <laughs> we mentioned also that the Prophet وسلم, used to enjoy bathing with his wife. And there is a hadith where Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha ardaha stated that she used to bath along with the Prophet وسلم, having a container of water or a vessel in between them. And he used to beat her to the water. So the, she would laugh with him and say, let me, let me, يعني, let me grab some water. Uh, you know, so uh, having fun uh, is not being seized once you have uh, sexually satisfied your desire. Yeah, once you're done, you're now, not done. Yes, it's extended beyond that. Uh, she's, she's your uh, intimate friend. She's your best man in your life. She's your wife, similarly or to her. So that relationship should ex extend and continue even after having uh, an intimate relationship. So let me get what you're trying to say. Your relationship with your wife shouldn't be you come home and, you know, dinner, <laughs> where's my dinner? And then I, then I want to have some relationship with you. Then, <laughs> then I'm going to go take a shower. I'm going to go to bed. This shouldn't be your relationship. <laughs> your relationship <laughs> should be uh, fun and lighthearted and jovial. That's and, and, literally and, and, a machine. No, yes. You my know, pots are cold. How come my pots are cold? Mm. How come here? Now I'm going to be in the shower. <laughs> so this isn't good. Uh, no one doubts that the Prophet ﷺ will be the busiest uh -huh. man on earth. Right? Mm. Yes, of course. In the midst of all of that, he would call on Aisha and say, Ya Aisha, let's race. And that was, he was coming back from a journey, a long journey, and he had many of his companions. So he sent them away and said, Ya Aisha, let's race. I mean, I, I wouldn't believe it if it was there that the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, while he's extremely busy, the busiest man on earth is asking his wife to race. So she did race with him. And uh, she won because she was young. <laughs> and the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam keeps that in mind. Years later, as Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha wa gets uh, older and heavier, uh, he says, Ya yeah, Aisha, let's race. <laughs> well, she had forgotten about the, the first incident. So the second time the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wins, and then he says, this is <laughs> I'm paying you back. Or even you, Aisha. Okay, I'm going to go and uh, try to round up something for us to, to eat, something for us to drink, and then uh, we'll come back and we'll continue this. Inshallah. Inshallah. Brothers and sisters, to increase your iman. من تعلم القرآن وعلمه وردت للقرآن ترتيلا Learning how to recite the Quran properly Learning the meaning of what we recite Concluding the ahkam from the verses which we recite Trying to implement what we learn in our daily life we Would listen to the participants and the guests Will take your phone calls We're going to recite life We'll would listen to your recitation and will correct it according to the rules and regulations which will state in each episode. Now, your dream will come true. Will come true. <laughs> We've been talking about all the fun stuff, all the stuff, you know, like, hey, hey, we're having fun with our wives. But what about the, the, the business aspect of it? What about, like, inheritance and uh, all the financial aspects of marriage? We haven't talked about those. Those are big. True. And uh, this is actually what, uh, whatever you just brought up, this is actually uh, one of the rights, which are shared rights between uh, the, 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 the spouses, the husband and the wife. Uh, and this is very interesting before, because before Islam, it was totally different. But when Islam came and when the Quran was revealed, it stated all the rights for both, not only for one of them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stated, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, 
لا يحل لكم أن ترثوا النساء كرها ولا تعضلوهن لتذهبوا ببعض ما آتيتموهن The call is upon the, believer, the believers, all you who believe, it's not permissible for you to inherit women against their will. And we'll explain how. Nor should you treat them with harshness to make them give you some of what you have given them in dowry mm. without mm. a just reason. Basically, Sayyidina Zayd ibn Aslam narrated that Ahl Yathrib, the people of uh, Medina before the Prophet ﷺ had come and before oh, Islam, uh, they have this habit. If a man dies, leaving behind a lot of wealth, children and a wife, his wife would be also concluded as a part of his wealth. Mm -hmm. So his heirs, uh, his brother, his father, or his uh, you know, cousin would capture everything, including his wife. How would they split her up? <laughs> he would take her. <laughs> he would take her. To do what? Well, if she's pretty, he would marry her. And if she's not, he would keep her. He would not even allow her to go free or to get married. Unless if she wants to, she has to pay. Mm -hmm. So not only losing a husband and not getting anything out of his wealth, which is her right, but also... She has to give some money. Yeah, out. giving a ransom. Mm -hmm. Freeing herself like a slave, even though she was a free woman. Mm -hmm. So Islam came to demolish all those false practices and state the following rights to both man and a woman. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stated in Surah Al-Nisa that وَلَكُمْ نِصْفُ مَا تَرَكَ أَزْوَادُكُمْ إِلَّمْ يَكُلْ لَهُنَّ وَلَدٍ فَإِنْ كَانَ لَهُنَّ وَلَدٍ فَلَكُمُ الرُّبْعُ مِمَّا تَرَكْتُمْ This ayah of Surah Al-Nisa explains the inheritance law between the spouses, just in case if any of them dies first. So he says to the man that you get half, half of the inheritance of the wealth of your wife if she does not have a son from you or from somebody else. But if she does, you only get one quarter. Of course, after you distribute, uh, you pay off the well and the debt and so on. And what is, what is the case if the husband dies? They get one quarter of your wealth, of what you leave behind, if you don't have a son. But if you do, then you only get one-eighth. First of all, we have to keep in mind that's a divine legislation that came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not from Prophet Muhammad sallallahu not from any human. Second, we have to study the case before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed those beautiful verses where compare when a woman has no rights whatsoever. Yeah, Islam was the first religion to give women rights in any way, in yes. any shape or form. Versus now, she owns herself, her freedom freedom of getting married after the iddah, the waiting period, uh, freedom of possessing her own wealth and spending it whichever way she likes as long as it is in the proper way and inheriting the wealth of her husband if he dies first. Instead of the people taking it. <laughs> so this is a very, very important right. Uh, I thought it's very important to discuss. But uh, some people criticize the rule that a, a woman gets a half of what a man gets. And they, they said that this is unfair. How come? How I wish, Muhammad, you have attended with us from the beginning as we were talking about the qiwama and that degree which Allah uh, gave to men over women. And uh, we concluded that this degree is a degree of responsibility, yes. where a man is responsible for uh, housing, lodging, food, everything. Uh, everything. Mm -hmm. uh, who pays the dowry? The man. The man. The man. Who... Um, who is responsible for furnishing the house? The man. The man. Who is responsible for the spencher and spending on the house? The man. The man. Sending kids to school the and man. paying for... <laughs> 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 right? Mm -hmm. So keeping in mind that the man is in charge for all of that. That's number one. Uh, number two, that normally, in general cases, that men go to work. And they travel here and there and they accumulate and pile up wealth. Right?
Yeah. So let's say that a man left behind a hundred thirty thousand dollars. Okay. One fourth of that will be thirty thousand dollars. And one eighth fifteen thousand fifteen thousand dollars. But let's say that a woman collected from gifts here and there, inheritance from her father or whatever, uh, a wealth of 40,000. We're saying that men work more and they pile up wealth more than women. That's the general case, right? Sometimes there are exceptions. We have to uh, admit to that fact. So one half of the $40,000 20, is 20,000. And one fourth Jeez, is 10,000. 10, yeah. If a woman desires to get married after the Iddah, four months and ten days. She may, right? But she gets a dowry. Is she responsible <laughs> for paying anything? Uh -uh. No. 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 She gets once again a dowry, no. housing, and Lodging. all the spending is on. <laughs> Food, right? clothes. And that, uh, versus if she dies and he's planning to get married. He is responsible for paying a new dowry. <laughs> Putting a new house. Oh, you know, house. everything from the scratch. Everything. Somebody might say, but if he dies leaving behind children, they also get their share of the inheritance. Everyone gets their share. So we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most merciful and he knows best. His wisdom required that that should be the way of dividing the inheritance. Mm -hmm. And before criticizing or objecting, remember the case before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it this way. Yeah. And does the Creator know the condition of His creation better than we do? <laughs> SubhanAllah. No. Are there any other rights uh, uh, that we have mutually besides inheritance? Uh, there is many. Uh, one of them is of course having uh, uh, children. Uh, because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stated in one hadith that once uh, mm -hmm. the servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dies, all his righteous deeds will discontinue, except from three wives. He counted one of them as children. having not just children, right. a so righteous child, child a righteous son who will pray for him. Yes. Right? So it's not fair for a wife to deceive her husband. And because I've heard that, uh, a woman would say that I'm just testing him for the first couple of years, uh, whether he's going to be good to me or not. That's not fair. Uh, without informing him, she's been postponing uh, her conception. That's haram. And similarly, if the husband decides, I'm not going to really have children before I know her manners and study her very well, so that he would force her not to have children by taking contraceptives or, or etc. Having uh, a child is a right of both. That's a mutual right. Neither one of them should prevent the other from having and enjoying this right. Keeping in mind, it's all in Allah's hand. Uh, I mean that they may keep yeah. trying you try and have times, nothing. Have nothing. <laughs> but they should be thankful anyway. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who grants either boys, girls, or make them twins, or make them, make them infertile. <laughs> <laughs> no. So like, I know a lot of where I'm from, there's a lot of people that they don't want to have kids. You hear couples get married and they say, well, we're not having children. We, we have dogs. <laughs> that these are our babies, these dogs. And I've always thought, well, that's a, a strange way to live because the whole point of marriage, as I said once before, is, is to have children. That's the whole point. This is one of the uh, negatives of living in a society where the vast majority are not Muslims. The deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not been taught in the streets as well as in the schools. So that you get influenced, of course, negatively, right? Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, uh, some Muslim families acquire those uh, bad traits. So instead, they're very satisfied with their pet, whether it's a cat <laughs> or a dog. No, okay? <laughs> or might say, well, one is enough. Uh, I can barely take care of one. When the Prophet وسلم, when he initially uh, prescribed marriage, he said, uh, he advised us and enjoined upon us to get married. Why? So that we can have children, uh, as many as possible. Why? Because if you do, I'll be proud of you outnumbering other nations on the Day of Judgment. Doesn't every child bring its own risk? Doesn't it bring its own risk? Absolutely. Provision? Don't you ever think that it, it is you who provide for uh, your children? That's not true. Absolutely. 
uh, nor do you think that by having a, a child that would really reduce uh, um, your uh, wealth will take away from your saving and will affect you negatively. That's not true. Because it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who provides for us and for them. Before even they were created, before they were in the womb of their mothers, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had destined and ordained their provision and their risk. It's just that a person should really put their trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and understand that no one comes to this life without their provision. And even while in the womb, the angel would come and record their provision throughout their life. And what if some say we will only have one child or two children? We want to bring them up in the best way. Is that okay? What about if uh, they say we'll only have one child and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not give them any at all? Yes. Like, uh, like Suleiman when he said, I will <laughs> go and I will have, you know, relations with all my wife and I'll have a hundred sons. Mm -hmm. But he didn't say, uh, the, key, so yes. the key to all of that really is understanding your deen. So is it haram to learning, say so? Learning the message of the mm -hmm. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and putting your trust in Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Leave it to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Yeah, it's permissible to give uh, a gap between having children so that you'll be able to raise them. But to limit and say, oh, I'm not going to have but just one child. Mm -hmm. uh, it may be that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will not give you that child. Kids yeah. got playing around in there. <laughs> Uh, I think I got to go check. How many do you have? <laughs> I, <do. laughs> I think I need to go see what they broke yeah. in there. So, uh, inshallah, uh, next week we can get together again. Inshallah. So, exactly before we leave, I would like to uh, uh, supplicate this dua in the Quran. رَبَّنَا هَبْ لَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِّيَّتِنَا قُرَّةَ أَعْيُنٍ وَجَعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِمَامًا And Amen. I would like to say, سُبْحَانَكَ اللَّهُمَّ وَبِحَمْدِكَ نَشْهَدُ أَلَّا إِلَهِ إِلَّا أَنْتَ نَسْتَغْفِرُكَ وَنَتُوبُ لَيْكَ Allah khairan. May Allah bless you and your family. Thank you for the nice hospitality. Hospitality. I didn't do anything. I didn't even give you guys something to drink. And see you all next time. Jazakum Allah. Assalamu alaikum.